ascendiste a la gloria, oh Cristo nuestro Dios, y alegras a tus discípulos con la promesa del Espíritu Santo. Now this is Mary of Agrita, the city of God, and um, I think she's venerable if I'm not mistaken. So, we all have our favorites. Some of our favorites are Anne Catherine Emmerich. Some of us have her as a favorite. Some of us have Mary of Agrita. Some of us have others, Maria Valtorta or whatever. But um, I thought this was very, very beautiful. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, from Mary of Agrita, uh, City of God, Chapter 29, Christ our Redeemer ascends into heaven followed by all the saints in his company, he assumes with him his most holy mother and puts her in possession of glory. I'm already going to give a little gloss here. Uh, her description describes two things which have been deeply embedded in Catholic theology. One is that at the time of Christ's ascension, the Blessed Virgin Mary ascended with him although she also remained on earth, she sort of bilocated, but she was brought up into heaven. And it was when Jesus was assumed into heaven to, excuse me, assumed into heaven, ascended into heaven, two things happened. First of all, that was the moment in salvation history when his human nature was united with his divine nature. Wow. That is when he entered into the Most Holy Trinity with his human nature. Uh, in other words, his human nature had not flowed into his divine nature. The human nature and divine nature had not flowed together fully, maybe at all, actually, until his ascension. And it was at the time of his ascension that his human nature and divine nature were fully merged in the one person of Jesus. He was always one person, but he was always two natures, but those natures only became fused at the ascension, which is one of the reasons it's such a big deal, because it's basically when the divinization of mankind took place, or the potential for the divinization of mankind took place. It's also, I, I know I've been confused about this in the past, but from the reading I did for the Ascension, it seems that even though the artwork frequently shows Jesus leading the souls in limbo, limbo the fathers into heaven on Holy Saturday night, it seems like the theology of the church fathers was that the redeemed souls entered heaven at the Ascension that they were not able to enter heaven until Jesus was ascended, not was ascended, but ascended into heaven. And similarly, uh, the Blessed Virgin Mary um, ascended into heaven with Jesus, not in the same way, of course. And uh, she was crowned, she was crowned. This coronation took place at the time of the ascension. Look, this is not dogma. Uh, I believe it's not dogma. I think that, um, you know, there are other theological opinions that are respectable, including that she was crowned queen of heaven and of mankind, uh, you know, of all creation after the assumption. Stuff is confusing. Um, but I, uh, the people I read for today, put both the coronation of Mary and the um, ascent of the souls in um, the limbo of the fathers into heaven on the ascension. And um, if you remember the artwork that I had um, on the show card, let me pull it up now. It's Giotto. And um, you'll see... You don't have to see me 
So I, you know, I'll just, I'll just obscure myself with this. You see here, you see here angels, I guess you can't really tell here whether they're angels or whether they're souls of the just. So anyway, but you certainly can see it in Mary of Agrita, so I'd better get to her. The most auspicious hour in which the only begotten of the eternal father, after descending from heaven in order to assume human flesh, was to ascend by his own power and in a most wonderful manner to the right hand of God, the inheritor of his eternities, one and equal with him in nature and infinite glory. He was to ascend because he had previously descended to the lowest regions of the earth, having fulfilled all that had been written and prophesied concerning his coming into the world, his life, death, and the redemption of man, and having penetrated as the Lord of all to the very center of the earth. By this ascension he sealed all the mysteries and hastened the fulfillment of his promise, according to which he was with the Father to send the paraclete upon his church after he himself should have ascended into heaven, in order to celebrate this festive and mysterious day, Christ our Lord selected as witnesses the hundred and twenty persons to whom he had spoken in the cenacle. They were the most holy Mary, the, the most holy Mary, the eleven apostles, the seventy-two disciples, Mary Magdalene, Lazarus their brother, the other Marys, and the faithful men and women, making up the number of one hundred and twenty. Another gloss, okay. It's not obvious why the Ascension is such a huge feast day. I think one of the reasons it's not obvious is because the physics of salvation, we don't know the physics of salvation, it's beyond us. But Jesus himself said, it's better that I go because if I didn't go, I wouldn't be able to send the Holy Spirit to you. So somehow, somehow all of these things were tied together. I mean, in other words, you know, in the, in the physics of salvation, Jesus had to be reunited fully into the most holy trinity with his full human nature in order for the third person of the most holy trinity, the Holy Spirit, to be able to descend into mankind. And perhaps the Blessed Virgin Mary also had to experience what she experienced at the Ascension. In other words, probably what I'm alluding to is her coronation in order for the Holy Spirit to be able to enter into mankind. Because remember, the Blessed Virgin Mary is the spouse of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit acts only through the Blessed Virgin Mary, distributes his graces only through the Blessed uh, Virgin Mary. So perhaps she had to be quasi united with the most holy trinity for the holy spirit to descend she wasn't united with the most holy trinity she's not part of the most holy trinity but she's got a bond with the most holy trinity that is uh, absolutely unique in in the economy of salvation and she was espoused to the holy spirit in a sense at the annunciation that was a spousal act the conception of jesus in her womb but there is a, just like Jesus, the union of Jesus's divine nature and human nature took place when he ascended. It seems like the um, union of the, 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 I don't want to get in trouble here, uh, that Mary's, the Blessed Virgin Mary's union with the Most Holy Trinity took a new form and a deeper form with the coronation at the ascension, I guess that is a safe way to put it. Continuing with Mary of Agrita. With this little flock, our divine shepherd Jesus left the cenacle with his most blessed mother at his side and conducted them all through the streets of Jerusalem, proceeding in the direction of Bethany. The company of angels and saints from limbo and purgatory followed the victor with new songs of praise, although Mary alone was privileged to see them. Um, the Lord having, uh, 
Okay. They all ascended Mount, o Mount Olivet to its highest point. There they formed three choirs, one of the angels, another of the saints. Oh, I didn't put myself back up. Oh. Uh, um, okay. Uh, okay. I'm going to put this, actually, I'm going to put the uh, Giotto painting up. For a moment because it's actually quite relevant to what I'm reading right now. So there, I'll put them by the window here. Um, there they formed three choirs, one of the angels, another of the saints, and a third of the apostles and faithful, which again divided into two bands while Christ the Savior presided. So that's why I put up this picture again, because I, I think those are the three choirs of the saints the angels, and the uh, faithful and apostles. Then the most prudent mother prostrated herself at the feet of her son, and worshipping him with admirable humility, she adored him as the true God and as the Redeemer of the world, asking his last blessing. All the faithful there imitated her and did the same. Weeping and sighing, they asked the Lord whether he was now to restore the kingdom of Israel. The Lord answered that this was a secret of the Eternal Father, and not to be made known to them, but for the present, it was necessary and befitting that they receive the Holy Ghost and preach in Jerusalem, in Samaria, and in all the world, the mysteries of the redemption of the world. Now, it seems to me that he answered them sideways, because they asked whether he was now going to restore the kingdom of Israel. And in a way, his answer was, Yes, yes, I am restoring the kingdom of Israel now, and the way the kingdom of Israel is being restored is through the descent of the Holy Spirit and the preaching of the gospel. That the kingdom of Israel is not a kingdom of this world, but it is the kingdom of heaven acting in this world. Right? So in a way he was answering their question, but they didn't realize he was answering their question. And you can also take it as just like, nya, 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 I'm not going to tell you now. Now your business is spreading the church on earth. But I would argue that the business of spreading the church on earth is the restoration of the kingdom of Israel. The purpose of the worldly kingdom of Israel went away at that point in time to be replaced by the spiritual kingdom of Israel, which is the church made possible through the Holy Spirit. Makes perfect sense, right? Continuing. Jesus, having taken leave of this holy and fortunate gathering of the faithful, his countenance beaming forth peace and majesty, joined his hands and by his own power began to raise himself from the earth, leaving on it the impression of his sacred feet. Now you can see the impression of his feet in a stone that's preserved in the chapel of the Ascension, which is supposed to be actually not a stone moved there, but actually was the, was the stone that was there around which they built the Chapel of the Ascension in Jerusalem, should you be so fortunate. Okay. Um, leaving thereupon the impression of his sacred feet, in gentlest motion he was wafted towards the aerial regions, drawing after him the eyes and the hearts of those firstborn children who amid sighs and tears expressed their affection. And as at the moving of the first cause of all motion it is proper also that neither the nether sphere should be set in motion, so the Savior Jesus drew after him also the celestial choirs of angels, the holy patriarchs, and the rest of the glorified saints, some of them with body and soul, others only as to their soul. So again, you, you see that in the picture. It's like it's like, you know, he's, excuse the expression, he's sucking them up, right? He's like, he's, he's like producing this, this vacuum and he's going up into heaven and he's, he's drawing with them, uh, you know, like, like, you know, by like a vacuum would, the angels and the saints. And that's kind of captured in that painting. I also want to mention something. This says very carefully. He joined his hands and by his own power began to raise himself from the earth. Now, we say that Jesus ascended, active verb, and we say that the Blessed Virgin Mary was assumed into heaven, 
passive tense. Very important difference. Jesus ascended under his own power, and the Blessed Virgin Mary was taken up into heaven, not by her own power. She was simply the object of the act, whereas Jesus was the protagonist of the act, was the actor of the act. Okay. All of them in heavenly order were raised up together from the earth, accompanying and following their king, their chief, and head. The new and mysterious sacrament which the right hand of the Most High wrought on this occasion for his Most Holy Mother was that he raised her up with him in order to put her in possession of the glory which he had assigned to her as his true mother and which she had by her merits prepared and earned for herself. Of this favor the great queen was capable even before it happened, for her divine son had offered it to her during the forty days which he spent in her company after his resurrection. I'll, I'll finish the paragraph, but then I'll explain it a little bit. In order that this sacrament might, might be kept secret from all other living creatures at that time, and in order that the heavenly mistress might be present in the gathering of the apostles, and the faithful in their prayerful waiting upon the coming of the Holy Ghost, the divine power enabled the Blessed Mother miraculously to be in two places at once, remaining with the children of the church for their comfort during their stay in the cenacle, and at the same time ascending with the Redeemer of the world to his heavenly throne, where she remained for three days. There she enjoyed the perfect use of all her powers and faculties, where she was more restricted in the use of them during that time in the cenacle. Okay, so, so um, uh, I'm actually not reading the section in Mary of Greta where she fleshes this out, but she makes it very clear. I know she's only a visionary, so it may or may not be the case, but she makes it very clear that um, Jesus took Mary with him to heaven when he ascended, even though she also stayed on earth. Um, and she, when she was raised up in heaven, she was seated at his side as the queen mother of creation. Essentially, the coronation took place. Um, and uh, Mary of Agreed is calling it a sacrament. And she had been prepared for it uh, during the 40 days that Jesus was on earth. In other words, it didn't come as a surprise to her, but... Um, she, uh, she was told about it and she assented to it. You know, she gave her assent to it while Jesus was on earth after the resurrection during those 40 days leading up to the ascension. Um, Mary of Agrita points out that the disciples and apostles couldn't have handled losing both Jesus and Mary at that point. So Mary definitely had to stay on earth. And um, they couldn't be aware of what went on because it would seem like they had lost the Blessed Virgin Mary. And also, they weren't ready to, to know about her, her, you know, the fullness of her exalted stature. The superhuman aspect of her exalted stature, if I'm allowed to say that. Not literally superhuman, but in a sense superhuman because of her unfallen human nature. Um, and also, I would argue that she had to be there for Pentecost because the Holy Spirit, as we see in all the paintings, descended through the Blessed Virgin Mary to the apostles. So again, you know, her marriage to the Holy Spirit, her being the spouse of the Holy Spirit, um, was in some sense uh, culminated at the time of her ascension when she joined the Most Holy Trinity in a new way, which then enabled the descent of the Holy Spirit through her into the church at Pentecost. I don't know why MIT doesn't study this kind of physics instead of that boring kind of physics of subatomic particles. But anyway, it would do them a lot more good. Anyway, continuing. The Lord took with him his blessed mother in his ascension into heaven, and amid incredible rejoicing and admiration, filled her with splendor and glory in the sight of the angels and saints. It was also very appropriate that the apostles and the other faithful for the time being should be ignorant of this mystery, 
or if they had seen their mother and mistress ascend with Christ, their affliction would have been beyond all bounds and without recourse or relief. Nothing could ever console them for the departure of Christ more fully than to feel that they had still with them their most blessed lady and kindest mother. Even then their sighs and sobbing and tears welled up from their inmost hearts when they saw their beloved Master and Redeemer disappearing through the aerial regions. And when they had almost lost sight of him, a most resplendent cloud interposed itself between him and those he had left on earth. Again, you see that in this painting, right? You see that, I, I can't stick my finger over it, but you see that cloud under his feet, right? A most resplendent cloud interposed itself between him and those he had left upon earth, intercepting him altogether from their view. In it, the person of the Eternal Father descended from heaven to the regions of the air in order to meet the Son and the Mother who had furnished the new mode of existence in which he now returned. Coming to them, the Eternal Father received them in his embrace of infinite love to the joy of the angels who had accompanied the Father in innumerable choirs from his heavenly seat. In a short space of time, penetrating the elements and the celestial orbs, that whole divine procession arrived at the supreme regions of the Empyrean. At their entrance, the angels, who had ascended from earth with their sovereigns, Jesus and Mary, and those who had joined them in the aerial regions, spoke to those who had remained in the heavenly heights, and repeated those words of David and many others that referred to this mystery, saying, Open ye princes, open your gates eternal, let them be raised and opened up, and receive into his dwelling the great King of glory, the Lord of virtues, the powerful in battle, the strong and invincible, who comes triumphant and victorious over all his enemies. Open the gates of the heavenly paradise, and let them remain open and free forever, since the new Adam is coming, the repairer of the whole human race, rich in mercy, overflowing with the merits of his copious redemption wrought by his death in the world. He has restored our loss and has raised human nature to the supreme dignity of his own immensity. He comes with the reign of the elect and the redeemed, given to him by his eternal Father. Now his liberal mercy has given to mortals the power of regaining in justice the right lost by their sin to merit by the observance of his law as his brothers and co-inheritors of the goods of his Father, eternal life, and for his greater glory and to our greater rejoicing, he brings with him and at his side the mother of piety who gave him the form of man for overcoming the demon. She comes as our charming and beautiful queen, delighting all that behold her. Come forth, come forth, ye heavenly courtiers, and you shall see our most beautiful king with the crown given to him by his mother, and his mother crowned with the glory conferred upon her, by her son. That was all in quotes. I guess Mary of Agrita heard it. Okay. Amidst this jubilee and other rejoicing succeeding all our conceptions, that newly divinely arranged procession approached the Empyrean heavens. Between the two choirs of angels and saints, Christ and his most blessed mother made their entry. All in their order gave supreme honor to each respectively and to both together to both together breaking forth in hymns of praise in honor of the authors of grace and of life then the eternal father placed upon the throne of his divinity at the right hand the incarnate word and in such glory and majesty that he filled with new admiration and reverential fear all the inhabitants of heaven in clear and intuitive vision they recognized the infinite glory and perfection of the divinity inseparably and substantially united in one personality to the most holy humanity, beautified and exalted by the preeminence and glory due to this union, such as eyes have not seen nor ears heard, nor ever has entered into the thoughts of creatures. So there you have both events very beautifully graphically described the coronation of the Blessed Virgin Mary, her receiving the honors of heaven alongside her son, and the um, 
final uniting of human nature and divine nature in the one person of Jesus taking place. On this occasion, the humility and wisdom of our most prudent queen reached their highest point, for overwhelmed by such divine and admirable favors, she hovered at the footstool. I'm going to start reading that over again, because I don't think I gave it the right intonation. On this occasion, the humility and wisdom of our most prudent queen reached their highest point, for overwhelmed by such divine and admirable favors, she hovered at the footstool of the royal throne, annihilated in the consciousness of being a mere earthly creature. Prostrate, she adored the Father and broke out in new canticles of praise for the glory communicated to his Son and for elevating in him the deified humanity to such greatness and splendor. See, that's at the point at which humanity became deified, that humanity... Um, became partakers of the divine nature. Again, the angels and saints were filled with admiration and joy to see the most prudent humility of their queen, whose living example of virtue, as is exhibited on that occasion, they emulated among themselves in copying. Then the voice of the Eternal Father was heard saying, My daughter, ascend higher. Her divine Son also called her, saying, My mother, Rise up and take possession of the place which I owe thee for having followed and imitated me. The Holy Ghost said, My spouse and beloved, come to my eternal embraces. Immediately was proclaimed to all the blessed the decree of the Most Holy Trinity, by which the Most Blessed Mother, for having furnished her own lifeblood toward the Incarnation, and for having nourished, served, imitated, and followed him, with all the perfection possible to a creature, was exalted and placed at the right hand of her Son for all eternity. None other, of the, uh, none other of the human creatures should ever hold that place or position, nor rival her in the unfailing glory connected with it. But it was to be reserved to the Queen and to be her possession by right after her earthly life, as of one who preeminently excelled all the rest of the saints. Amen. 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 Okay? All I can say is I have been a fanatic Catholic for, I have to do the arithmetic, but almost 30 years, 29 or 30 years now. And um, today, reading Mary of Agrita, the scene for the first time, I feel like I, I get the ascension for the first time in my Catholic life. Um, I'll put this up. How sad. I'll, 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 uh, how can I do that? I'll put, a, I'll, I'll, one way or another in the next 10 minutes, I'll put a link to this text up on the, uh, description on this show. And I'll also put a link up to, um, Dom Geringer's description of the Ascension, which I don't want to say it draws heavily from Mary of Agrita, but it's it's very consonant with it. It, it agrees completely. Uh, it makes me think he might have read her, or her, her vision was completely consistent with the pious, historical, Catholic view of the Ascension. Um... You know what? Here's my assignment for you. Print it out and take it to the dinner table tonight and drive all of your family nuts by insisting on reading it. <laughs> the whole thing. The whole McGill up. It's only, what, you know, 10 minutes, 5 minutes? Because um, there is so much, there is so much uh, Catholic theology in there. There's so much economy of salvation. There's so much explanation or imagery of these incredibly deep mysteries having to do with the hypostatic union the the you know the divine nature and human nature in jesus the espousal relationship between mary and the holy spirit the um 
you know, the, the, uh, inheritance, the church being the kingdom of Israel after Jesus came, all this stuff is just explodes from this uh, passage.